So it leads me to the question about your, each of your engagement in this project of city building and what you think you're engaged in. Um, and maybe start with you, Sheila, as somebody who takes on very big projects. Um, <laughs> you know, what role do you see vision, grand vision or little vision have? And what, have, what do you bring from Jane Jacobs um, to that question of who owns the decision making? Who owns the, the city when it comes to growing it, planning it, changing it? Our role is to, from a Jane Jacobs perspective, um, to achieve the vision that our client and the public gives us, um, but also to allude to the questions that the client or the city doesn't always ask us. Mm -hmm. So that you don't necessarily just go for achieving the vision, but also remember that you have to um, consider what is there already and not from a Jane Jacobs perspective, this is, she talks a lot about it in her book, that not to destroy what is there already, which is already contributing towards those, that vision. Let me ask you, Andrea, you talked about, when we talked earlier about being both challenged and inspired by Jane Jacobs, and in some of the work that you've done, having to grapple with some conflicting um, criteria. Well, as an architectural firm, you might be engaged to look at a very large scale piece of land or a very large project that um, Jane would have opposed. But yet, what can you bring to it um, that is inspired by her? And it's the mixing of uses, the activation of the public spaces. Um, so give us an example. Um, well, for example, the, um, a master plan our firm did for the redevelopment of the, of the Domino Sugar Factory site. Um, the plan Did in a very the Domino Sugar Factory site in, in Brooklyn. The plan, um, in a very simple gesture, just extended the street grid to the river and created a park there. And then the the lower levels of all the buildings contained retail and community uh, retail spaces and community facilities. Um, and the idea being that more than just the occupants of that future housing project would benefit from those those spaces. So, I mean, on the other side of it is the height of the buildings and the scale of the development and how does the infrastructure catch up. And so all of these issues played out in the community dialogue and the formal process that I think was inspired by Jane. Um, you know, the way that a rezoning is achieved in New York um, and the community does have a voice. Um, you know, it's exciting to be a part of that process. Peggy, do you want to weigh in on this question? Of well, I, I, I appreciate um, your, your answer in the question. I think it's complicated for, for architects um, and uh, designers and landscape architects uh, because in some way the Jane Jacobs legacy is an, is an organic, um, uh, an advocation for an organic way of, of things developing, of the community working from the ground, ground up. I, I do think that one of the things that um, what needs to be talked about is, um, and I think this will maybe be coming up, how it is that one can actually serve a vision um, and, and that there are certain leaders around vision and, and that um, architects and landscape architects want, want to be at the table. So it's not a totally um, ground up process um, in some way. And so how we actually facilitate um, the right audience in some way, but not only let it land on laissez-faire, um, is, is an issue, I think, for all of us. So who did you bring to the table for your San Francisco development? So the, the project that uh, Laura is referring to is called the 5M Project. It's a, a four-acre mixed-use uh, development project in the first phase uh, downtown San Francisco. Um, and I, I think what, was, what has thus far been really key to its success is, is a vision. I, I have to agree with that. Um, a vision of a woman named Alexa Arena who is, works for Forest City. Her vision was that development can, can happen very differently um, and that we can think about our downtown core differently uh, and that arts, creativity, um, and collaboration are really going to be central to the way in which we break through to kind of a new, a new way for our cities to live and breathe. Um, she also, I think, embraces quite a bit of Jane Jacobs' theories around um, you know, illuminating and embracing what has been what is while reaching for what can be. 
Uh, and, and, you know, I, for us, it, 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 it's a, quite a bizarre set of partners. Um, at the time, I was at Intersection for the Arts, which is a very small arts organization by most measurements, very small. And of course, Forest City is extremely large, and it is for profit. And we were sort of equally in the conversation. And, and what I often tell people, especially those who say, aren't you scared? Um, you know, are, are, what, are you going to be exploited? You know, whatever, I could use all kinds of phrases. Um, uh, that I think the thing is that the world has changed in, in many ways, and it, it's not the first time that it has, but we need each other um, across boundaries, across values, across, like, we, it, we don't have to value the same things, but we need to have this, a similar idea to what we're trying to get to. Um, and in that way, the partnerships can be leveled. They can be much more equitable. The stakes are high, you know, and I'm not gonna stand on the sidelines and protest it. I wanna be a part of trying to make something that can be better than what it otherwise would mm. be. So yeah, it's nonprofits, it's artists, it's community leaders, it's architects, designers, it's it, you know, policy makers, and all of those people together will help to make it successful. Mary, this speaks a little bit to the, to the process that you talk about, about community engagement that your art creates, and yet artists have to have a clear vision of what you're doing. I, I think that um, you know, this project of trying to turn Broadway into the green corridor of the city, it's, I'm a little studio, I only have a couple people working in it, and uh, we're partnering with all kinds of people. And having them start to be emissaries for us in a way uh, for connecting with the neighborhoods, and then we, you know, continue with that. Uh, but, you know, if you, uh, you know, there's this vision that uh, we have of this corridor really um, becoming the place where you can see new ideas about a city of sustenance. And what we'd like to imagine is that tentacles are going out with uh, all the people we talk to, the, uh, the community groups, the bids, the uh, community boards. Uh, we had this amazing uh, walk with uh, uh, somebody from the Mailman School of Public Health up at 168th Street a couple of weeks ago. And not only are they doing this fabulous work, they're in touch with all of these community groups. So it's like you touch one, one group and then they allow you to touch a much larger group. So um, it's just, it's such an exciting process. And yet when you were getting involved in the post 9-11 uh, response in downtown New York, you had a challenge getting yourself a place at that table. You know, that's the, that's the thing that really interests me, is how uh, people in the arts, how art, artists, architects, visual thinkers can get a place at the table, not just by being uh, hired by a developer to do something, but you know, how could uh, the kind of insights, the ability to engage people, really begin to change the city. And after 9-11, I lived downtown and we proposed a perimeter for the edge of ground zero. There was no room for anything that wasn't about power or money downtown at that point. We were trying to figure out a way that people could come as mourners rather than as voyeurs. There was just no way that an artist could enter the conversation. And I think that it's just cities are missing so much without having that uh, ability to communicate integrated into their lives. Has the integration changed in the years you've been doing this work, Gail? Well, I have a much more optimistic view. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and I think it's, uh, if you really think about you know, where Jane was in, in, the, in the 60s, I'm sure I would like to first say, gee, I think she'd probably be happy with what's happening now. But of course, she wouldn't be, because she'd <laughs> all be on to pushing us to do the next thing. But I think that the game has changed that it is, if you think about Rouse in the 60s doing the festival marketplaces, it was trying to get people and, and being active out on the street and getting density and all of those things that she espoused to, and that now the streets of cities are all festival marketplaces. It has become the way in which uh, we live, it's become the way in which we play, it's become the way in which we work, and we do it all at the same time, and it's very democratic. And I think that, you know, the, the, I, I'll, I'll stop. 
I'm a, I guess I represent the developer <laughs> community here. I think that, that what is happening is that capital uh, and development is being responsive to the democratization that everybody wants things that are interesting and so on. So the old idea of creating an artificial festival place or then the next generation of doing mixed use, which is what she talked about, which meant, heaven forbid, you mixed uses. And then the next thing was you do your normal commercial development, whether it's residential or office at top, and you put some shops in here. Uh, that weren't, weren't very interesting because they thought about doing the chain kinds of things. And what's happened is that everybody wants interesting, um, entrepreneurial, authentic, cool, f interesting food, interesting everything, and that all of everyone is opening up and doing new things, and that, in fact, the development community and the community, I guess I would define the community in a different way in terms of being all of us. I think what Jane saw as being very important is in fact happening everywhere. It's happening in New York, it's happening in San Francisco, and indeed it's happening in that everybody, nobody wants that boring place where there are no people and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can all be really excited about and are all living our lives in a way that is, we're all Jane Jacobsons. We're Jane Jacobsians, is that yeah, what we are? Yes, <laughs> well put. Talk a little bit, Gail, because you're on a roll and your optimism, I don't want to pierce it um, just yet. Um, talk about what you've been doing in Baltimore, what you were involved in with, M with Johns Hopkins. The, the Baltimore example, uh, Johns Hopkins Medical School formed a, uh, they're in the middle of the neighborhood that was 70% depopulated, 70% vacancy. Literally the show The Wire was filmed around that neighborhood. Uh, there were armed guards at the corner of every uh, um, corner around the hospital, and it was a very difficult place. The city, uh, the Anna E. Casey Foundation, uh, Johns Hopkins as a major stakeholder, uh, did a, a um, bought out all the residents, tore down the houses. Uh, gave them money, far more than the value of their houses, to move. They had the chance to move back when it was done. And then they did an, an RFP uh, to create a new mixed income, uh, mixed use neighborhood uh, on 50 acres of land around the, the campus. Built a new school, built new retail, uh, lots of local jobs. And so that was something that never could have happened without that public-private partnership and couldn't have happened without all of those players contributing. And even so, the economics didn't work. They put out an RFP and Forest City uh, was selected to be the developer and it's gonna be a 30-year development. Where would Jane Jacobs have stood on something like that, Peggy? Because it is yeah, big. Good, it's big it in a way. Well, I'm, boy, I'm not sure. In I relation know, to but Little. But I, I, I appreciate your, your starting your comments with saying that what Jane Jacobs would have argued for back then is different than what would be argued for now because things are different and she would be arguing for change. But um, my, my reaction to the scenario that you're describing is that in some way the market has picked up the Jane Jacobs um, cry. And, um, and I'm not positive that that's what <laughs> Jane Jacobs would have actually in, intended. You know, in, in some way, um, we could say, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is totally what you're describing, but the marketing of lifestyle in some way is, is what this has turned into, and I think that she would not be pleased with, 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 that, with that kind of description. Um, and uh, you know, the, the kind of turning over of, of the street as, as festival to, um, to developers who will, who will um, they basically hit a particular market, and I don't think that's the general um, disempowered population, you know, it should be talked about. It also should be talked about that universities are nonprofit organizations, and so when they actually buy properties in cities, they don't actually have to pay taxes. And so it's a very, very difficult proposition when universities expand and, and say that it's in the, in the cause of, of city planning. Um, Andre, coming back to you, you talked about Greenwich Village. I mean, it's hard, not to, it's hard to imagine that Jane Jacobs wouldn't have had a few things to say about NYU right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's safe to assume she would be in the opposing <laughs> camp. Um, I mean, we, I, we haven't been involved in that uh, campus, but um, I think again, you know, it's very, well, as an architect, it's easy to see both sides because you understand that 
universities today, especially universities that are landlocked and that don't have that reserve of growth space like Alston and Harvard or uh, Manhattanville uptown, um, where are they going to go but up? And to stay competitive, the universities need you know, bigger floor plates, higher floor to floor heights. Um, they need more amenities to retain their faculty. Um, and so it's a, it is a complex set of issues. How has the changing economy changed some of these equations? You, you talk about that a good amount. That, and, and you do too, Sheila, the need to take on, to grapple with scale at a different level from uh, 40, 40 years ago. Sheila? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, or my perspective, um, Jane Jacobs wasn't against uh, large scale. Uh, she was just against space for the sake of space and not considering what creates life in a community uh, and considering uh, eyes on the street and assimilation of children and so on and so on. But from Big's perspective, we share Mary's optimism. Um, I, I think there are, we continue to improve cities across the world, uh, grapple with similar um, issues and problems, gentrification and... Um, uh, friction between between groups um, and so on. But I think one of the things that we're very engaged in at BIG currently is injecting deliberate social benefits into infrastructure. For example, someone mentioned the High Line as their uh, favorite place. Um, that's a great example of... So we had this industrialization uh, period and a lot of those infrastructural institutions or systems now no longer serve the function that they were created to serve. They've been decommissioned or they, we just don't need that function anymore. So what we're seeing is around the world, cities are trying to rethink how they can use that existing infrastructure. The High Line is a great example of that. Um, and so we're thinking about how can you not just use decommissioned infrastructure to generate new social benefits, but how can you think that into urban planning from the get-go? Um, so how can you birth infrastructure with benefits to the community? I think that there is a way of uh, considering infrastructure that's about, I think the high line is great, but actually it's a social benefit, but it's very disconnected socially. And I think that considering, um, as we look at, at you know, kind well, just, of just elaborate what you mean by that, because people are wondering what you mean by um, the people on the High Line are not the same people that live in the housing. Well, it's 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 this beautiful jewel-like uh, uh, place with the extra guards and extra money and extra everything. Um, I'd love to see it tied back into the city. Uh, for instance, what if all the roofs along that corridor were watering that uh, corridor and the people saw the runoff water from the High Line and so the people begin to relate to it not just as a beautiful place to look out, but what if they begin to understand uh, where they live and what's happening in the city in a different way through uh, being up there. Uh, Jane Jacobs celebrated diversity, density, the mix of people, all of the things that we're all talking about, mingling, people on different schedules. You're all saying, well, but these principles are now being adopted into city planning in this wonderful way by everybody. But we're looking at cities that are more class divided than ever before, more racially divided by, than ever before. We have in this city a net exflux now. Is there such a thing as an exflux? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a net exodus of African Americans and Puerto Ricans from New York City for the first time you know, since before Jane Jacobs' time. We have, I was just the other day, yesterday, up at the Brooklyn Armory um, site where you've had this extraordinary community organization manage to <coughs> secure a community benefits agreement from the developer. Um, but the developer's plan is to make the largest ever skating rink <laughs> right there in the Bronx on Knightsbridge Avenue. So these community benefits will be contingent on a skating rink suddenly becoming a really huge success in the middle of the Bronx. Maybe the NHL is about to look very different. Um, but my question is, how do we have this happy story about built city building in a very scary time, I think, for the principles that Jane talked about and the way that she lived. Greenwich Village is a very different place. Chelsea is a very different place. Tribeca, I, 
Um, <laughs> well, I think you my, my neighborhood, Soho, used to be pleasantly scary. <laughs> Not anymore. You want to go first? No, I, I think you bring up a very interesting point, which is why I mentioned the Upper West Side at the beginning, because when I go to, let's say, Baisley Park, which is a NYCHA project north of JFK, and I look at that and I think, first of all, I can't even get there by subway, and there are these Corbusian buildings sitting in these unusable lawns with fences around them and playgrounds that are broken. And, and no place to shop, no place to eat. It's completely disconnected. It's isolated from the urban fabric. And it really is a huge challenge of, you know, if, if you want an experience of being able to get places easily and enjoy nature a few steps from your house and have all the things that those of us who live in Tribeca or, you know, the Upper West Side have, how do you start to, what, what's the equation to bring that into these other neighborhoods? And I think, that it does involve public-private partnerships. I think it involves everything we're talking in, about. I think, you know, the developers in New York, are, New York are progressive and they're smart and they want to do a good job. I think that, um, you know, that developers who focus on building community are really able to do it. In the South Street Seaport, where there was this abandoned block, the developers there actually handpick mom and pop restaurants to put in there. They really worked hard to get the community scale. They didn't just, you know, go to Starbucks and go to Citibank. And so the, you know, I think how can we bring the right people together to start to weave this back in to the communities? And we're looking at that with big where we're focusing on um, the Sandy recovery and how do we protect lower Manhattan and other neighborhoods from the next surge and you know on the one hand you need to make a big infrastructure move you know the question is after robert moses can new york stomach a major move could could we build a green belt like chicago has all around lower manhattan and have it be a levee that's occupied with wonderful that looks like riverside park all around lower manhattan maybe not you know so then you start to scale that down and you say well what can we do um, you know, in Hudson River Park, what can we do in Tribeca? What can do, we do in Chelsea? What can we do at the tip? And then you come around to the housing above the Brooklyn Bridge, and you say, well, how can we protect those communities, maybe with a major park move, with a, with a levee, um, with a subway running under it, and the FDR under it, so we're creating this wonderful parking connection to the waterfront, and then how can we weave that you know, take the Lower East Side and start to weave it into those isolated buildings and create places. So that's really the challenge that we're grappling with as we speak. Did anybody else notice how all her really good suggestions involved a lot of landscaping? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because people, because, because I have to say that dollar for dollar, pragmatically speaking, the cheapest way to do flood protection is with earth structures. It is cheaper than floodgates. It is cheaper than all the stuff people have to do in their buildings. It is so. All right, so just lest anyone th think we're only going to dump on New York, San Francisco has the same problem. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so I, I feel like we're 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 not just talking about making places. We're actually talking about building community and making places where very different kinds of people who have either very different opportunities or very different struggles can come together and find value in each other's success. Do things. Yeah. And so, to me, being an arts person, not someone who makes buildings. It's so much about, and Mary, I think the way you articulate it is, is quite beautiful. It, it's so much about how we integrate our value into a system. I think what we need is new social systems. Mm. We need a new continuum or an understanding of a continuum that connects par you know, through partnerships and programs, art making, place making, workshops, mentorships, jobs, like we need to make connections and understand how we actually all are in this together. And each of us, whether we're architects, designers, artists, social service workers, policy makers, is a part of that continuum. So I'm, I'm much more interested in integrating into that. I, I believe wholeheartedly that artists are an essential component at almost every step of the way. 
And I'll just give two quick examples. In San Francisco at the 5M Project, which is located at 5th and Mission, if you know San Francisco, if you turn right out the door, you're at the Westfield Mall, which is probably one of the fanciest shopping districts on the West Coast, right? If you turn left, you're on the Sixth Street Corridor, which is considered by many to be one of the most socially challenging places in our city. Our job is to make sure that all of the people who are coming in that have access to new resources and new opportunities don't just turn right. They need to also turn left. We can't ignore what is to this side because we're more comfortable on what is on that side. We can't imagine that we are, that we are able to choose what is our problem and what is someone else's. Mm -hmm. Art can do that, right? Nearby, there's a, uh, an elementary school. M the, a good majority of the kids in that school are either homeless or they're marginally housed. It's, it's hard for me to imagine how those kids will, will actually think that they're in any way going to be the technology innovators, the designers, the gamers of the future when they're trying to figure out how they're going to eat or where they're going to sleep, right? And they need to know that they can change their lives. And art has a role to play in that as well. So I feel like that's just one example from where I sit of how all of this is, it's not just about the physical place, the city, the building, it's about how we all work together to make something that is more equitable, that results in more opportunities, safer places, and more inspiration for more people. I mean, I have to say, if we, so this question, it says, women as city builders, right? The title of the panel. So we have spent two weeks now trying to figure out how to address this question, <laughs> um, because no one wants to say women don't build towers. They do. Um, no one wants to say women have community vision and men have vision vision. Um, <laughs> we've all said, you know, if the makeup of this panel were different, racially, class-wise, mm -hmm. ethnic-wise, you know, geography-wise, it would be different. And yet there is something about a woman's gaze, a woman's vision. I mean, she had assimilating children in chapter number four. I, I don't think you'd find that in a city planning book by John Jacobs. Sheila. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we've, we've, we've talked about this uh, over the last few weeks. But I mean, there are, to me, there are two sort of undeniable things that set women apart from men. We can bear birth and nurture children. That's undeniable. And we're very good at using our gender as a platform to talk from. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's our problem. <laughs> but, well, I, you know, but I'm not sure anymore that, funnily enough, um, and English isn't my first language, so please forgive me. We no long, women no longer have the monopoly on what we have dubbed female values, mm. as men no longer have the monopoly on what we call male values. Whereas maybe pre previously they did. There's a reason we call it male and female values, and we call it hard and soft values. Um, Yes, I think that we bring, as, as a group, we bring something to the community and to every industry that has embraced women and different races and ages and genders and so on. I certainly am grateful to my mother's and grandmother's generation that they paved the way for me. I'm not sure anymore that there is a, a grouped difference between men and women mm. um, and, and not as city builders, but I feel confident that we have to be here in order to co contribute to the discussion. Laura. Well, I think that women have played a huge role in urban design in the Bloomberg administration, and I'll be curious to see if there's a male head of city planning, whether they will do social seating and all the you know, things that Amanda has really brought to urban life to make plazas hospitable so people can actually turn and talk to each <laughs> other as opposed to sitting in isolated Amanda places. Burns. And you know, and, and in my world, actually, the um, the Park Conservancy world, Betsy Barlow Rogers, really took back the you know central. She started the idea of a public-private partnership, the first public-private partnership to take back a park. And uh, and then I think of Warry Price at the Battery, who's also doing that, and Madeline Wills, who's here. And these are all almost all women, and also in in um, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Regina Meyer. So I, and, and you know, I think women treat these landscapes very experientially. What will the mother and the child do when they walk into the park? Where will they go? What, you know, can we give the kids fishing poles at the Harlem Mirror? What kind of programming are we going to do to address what you were saying, like to build community in the park? And, and it's all very human. 
Because you're talking about putting yourself in the head of someone who's deciding right. are they going right and left. Exactly. You talked about That's imagining. That's what I'm talking about, like putting yourself in the shoes of the person experiencing the place. You know, where will the lovers go? Where will, you know, where, where do you propose? It's just all these scenarios of how are people in public space? Well, and I think, I think that the, the question just always has to be asked, who's, who's talking and who's not? Like, mm -hmm. who's here and who's not here? I think that's a, a really important question. Um, and, and the fact is, I, I don't know as much in the world of planning and here and versus San Francisco, but the fact is men still hold the, more of the jobs, more of the power. And, and regardless of, of how we've changed and how we approach, that, that's still a fact and power is power. So I'm torn between going big and going small. Um, I want to ask something about security. Um, when I went back and was reminded of Jane Jacobs talking about eyes on the street, mm -hmm. who were your eyes on the street? I was thinking, oh my god, we have so many eyes on the street now, and they're mostly attached to a camera. <laughs> you know. So has our attitude towards do-it-yourself surveillance, as she put it, um, changed? And then my other question, a very contemporary question, is have our would, would she be horrified by how we all are busy communicating while we're walking down the street, but with nobody that is in the street <laughs> yeah. um, on our phones? Our networks now travel with us in weird ways, even we're in, when we're in abandoned, dull, or you know, personless spaces. I have a really quick, quick um, story about security and networks, I think, and, and this is just us in San Francisco paying hom homage to an artist named Candy Chang, um, who does extraordinary work in public space. And you know, in, in, uh, on the side of the San Francisco Chronicle building, um, place where a lot of people who are homeless and, and otherwise would, would spend time, um, we wanted to put up uh, chalkboards in the shape of the questions, who, what, when, where, and why. And we did all this, we pulped uh, sculpture projects um, also in the shape of those questions, and then a bunch of community workshops. And the whole idea was to say, you know, who, it, who has been here, who's here now, who do we want to be, what do we want this neighborhood to be? It was to solicit community input. And the security guards from the Hearst Corporation were hands down opposed to this. At some point through it, we got two unsolicited letters from two different security guards, very beautiful, eloquent letters about how beautiful they thought the project was, about how much it transformed um, the feeling of safety and the actual safety in the alleyway, and how proud it seemed to make people feel. So it's one security yeah. slash network. <laughs> I have another take on, on your, your point about the communication, because I hate to see everybody walking around with their the PDA in, in their hand. And yet, Jane talked about neighborhoods. Uh, and people have created, it is a virtual neighborhood, but are much more connected to one another uh, than I, I think in Jane Jacobs' time or, or any other time. And they're learning and they're, so it's a very vibrant kind of thing. But I believe that that also makes place, physical place, that much more important and is a great uh, supporter of people coming together. People can quickly say, I'll meet you at, at such and such. Uh, and that you can work when you're on the street, you can play when you're on the street, you can do multiple things. So that I think in a strange way it has separated us, and I mourn that greatly, but in another way I think it has been a very important thing with respect to people really wanting to connect and to, we haven't used the word authenticity, uh, that we're wanting our urban places to be very authentic, and I think that that's what Jane talked about. Andre, did you want to come in on this? Um, I would, I mean, I just think that the, um, in general, the feeling of act, the, I'm improving the experience of moving through the city with, um, you know, bringing the festival into the city, whether it's, I mean, into the street, whether it's artificial or not, um, does improve feelings of safety and, and comfort. And whether people are totally disengaged or not, um, it makes it much easier to move around on foot, and it's also healthier. I'd be curious to know from each person um, what is most important to them, uh, to each of you, to bring to the city. I know what it is for me. I was thinking about this. It's really an intimacy of engagement with very specific place-based situations. 
but intimacy, uh, a, a really direct, visceral engagement with it, even if it's with a storm sewer, you know, or with a tree, or with, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, really um, being able to understand something of, in a very uh, close-up way. Um, that's what I would love to see happening, you know, repeatedly all over the city. I want to I wanted, I wanted be able to actually walk down the street, and I don't think Manhattan lets you do that anymore. Move to Brooklyn, left Tribeca. I can't, I don't like Manhattan because it's too crowded, and now the people with their cell phones are walking really, really slowly because they're talking, and so just to get from <laughs> point A to point B is a real bummer. And so I, I actually, for all the density, and I think that one of the successes you know, one of the realizations that's, that's come um, is that we don't have to fight for density the way that Jane Jacobs said. We love density. We're an example of density. And it's too dense. There is a moment of too dense. It's too dense. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you propose to incorporate protest sites, as Jane Jacobs would have appreciated, into the cities that, that we're building? Um, we have this issue. Where do you go for a discussion about the... 99%, 1%, or about any of the things we're talking about. Well, I think this is what I was saying, that you know, the city is like this jungle where the buildings are like the vines, and it's like to get these public spaces, you have to clear them out and really design for them and plan for them. So I think that you know, as we're developing new parts of the city or even existing parts of the city, we have to create these spaces. Well, I think there are spaces that are there that are like you know, at uh, 23rd Street, there's this whole area that's been, because of the change of you know, closing down part of the street, there's this, mm. and it's just, it's being used in a strange way. I mean, uh, it could be more, it could function better as a public space. It's not, it's really a place to only drink coffee and to set up displays uh, that the bid would like to have there. I mean, it's commercializing the space. Um, I just see these spaces that are appearing all over the city uh, as the bike lanes have gone in, mm -hmm. and it seems like they could be used in so much better a way. I mean, because Roberta Graz has talked about public space as a manifestation of democracy, right? Of democracy's need for a place of, with people of different opinions to engage in unplanned activities, I think is how she puts it. But it, it, we it, have it's, any? it's not incidental that, that Zuccotti Park was, uh, was private, and that's how they could do it, because if it had been public, the police could have come in you know, when the sun went down and say, get out of here, and they would have had the right to do it. The fact that it was private absolutely mattered. And I think I have less faith that we can design the public space that we'll want protest. I think our government doesn't want us to protest, and we'll make sure that we don't do that. Well, and there's something about, um, I think, what you're, what you're getting at, too, is that, and I think of this about theaters and, and other designated places. Like there, there's a time in which we want those, that designated space, that space that's made for something. And then there's the time when we just need to take something over and redefine it. Okay. And in San Francisco, they're, they're, the mayor's office of innovation just launched something called living innovation zones. Um, I can't tell you how successful it is yet, <laughs> but the overall idea is to just designate some areas that need intervention. Um, and just relax the permit, relax all of it, mm -hmm. so that for a period of time, people who are creative can try to get at it. Mm -hmm. um, and then those places also become gathering places, or that people, people will just flow in when they know suddenly that it's free, like that you mm -hmm. can try something in a place. Whereas when it's designated to be something, it, unless it's, you know, unless you can, you can be intimidated to try to imagine it into something different. We remember those places at the, at the, not just the Republican, but the Democratic conventions too, where they had free speech zones. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. That's where all the protesters were herded over there. Yeah, because then, and then you're isolating them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but I think this question of what has happened to our public space and is it actually private space yeah. um, is, is a really good, a good question. Good and do city planners have a responsibility to even think about this? Mm -hmm. And just to say, Union Square was designed as a place for the unions, unions. to actually gather and, and, um, and, you know, and pr protest or, or, or you know, gather for their demands. And um, that's gone out the window, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't there to, to buy chachkas or green vegetables. Right. Do we need to remember how to play on the streets? Could art help us? Mary. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like one for you. Yeah. <laughs> I have this fantasy that 
you know, cities have to do things for really good reasons so people don't get hurt. But I would like, um, I think we all are trying to learn a new way to live. And I would like city bureaucrats to realize they have to learn a new way to live. It's, it's time for change in that, you know, for a long time you couldn't even consider uh, doing anything to the shoreline because of regulations. And now people realize you have to do things at the shoreline. That's, that's the case with the whole city. We have to think differently about our cities now, whether it's play or, you know, protest or, or whatever. And I think that uh, we need to put them all in a big washing machine or something. <laughs> this living innovation zone is one thing, and when it's run by the city that already sort of counteracts its ability to be free. But, but I think that you know, in San Francisco, there have been a lot of efforts to, to take something over for a, just a period of time. Um, we did a thing called Upfest last year, I think, where we did a call out for artists. We did a 48-hour like, hackathon with artists and designers. We picked very particular areas in, in a particular zone in the city with problems. We just said, like, what, this crosswalk doesn't work, or what do you do with a chain link fence, or what do you do with a long block where there's absolutely nothing to interact with. And then we put up all the best ideas in their sort of prototype form for a day, and we brought out director of planning, the mayor, the, the mm -hmm. district supervisor, to sort of say, like, look what can happen. 5,000 people came, look what can happen. Mm -hmm. And some of those projects then got adopted more permanently. There's a few questions along this line. Um, in Coney Island, a lot of the new development seems like it could be much more visionary and more inclusive to the needs and desires of the different communities. How do we, the public, get a seat at the table when it often feels like our voices are not really being taken seriously by the city and big development companies? Advice. Can they come knock on your door, they, the public? Um, I just wanted to speak to one example from Please. A project that we did in, uh, in Copenhagen, in probably what comes closest to being a, uh, a ghetto in Copenhagen. It's a, it's a small stretch of social housing. Bet between these blocks of housing, there was um, decommissioned railroad lines. They were no longer in use. And so the city wrote out a competition to do a park there. Now, that could very well have ended up being just a dead space, a park with no reason to go there, no destination as such other than sort of a stretch of grass. Um, it was a difficult part of the city, 60 different nationalities of ethnic minorities, um, and there was a lot of friction there. Big together with um, some very talented artists and very talented uh, landscape architects, um, put in a bid and we won it. And so across this two to three mile stretch of old railroads, we utilized the, the local community and their nationalities to, we asked them, what is the thing that you are most proud of from your home country? What are things that you can bring to the table that, um, for example, Moroccans have a history of uh, water and investigating water and utilities and so on. So we put in, we made this huge park, we put in uh, a Moroccan fountain, not to necessarily just because we like Moroccans, but to celebrate some of the capabilities that come from these nationalities. Um, there was a Mexican bench, because it's an S-curve bench, and the people who sit on the bench look at each other in the eyes. Um, there's a slide from Chernobyl. There's a whole variety. There's a donut sign from, from the US, something that you can't buy <laughs> in, in Denmark. <laughs> and it's just to say that this community has been transformed from an unsafe, um, it's still the same ethnic minorities, it's still social housing, but through sort of a planning of a park, and, uh, and not just a park, but actually celebrating the differences in that community, um, we transform that into a safe and um, celebratory destination. Would you say it was the product or the process? I think the process had a lot to do with it because we engaged the community in making now a showcase um, of the best, best practice urban furniture. Just to follow up on that, I mean, I think it's also the process of having competitions, which, you know, when the AIA or the ASLA or MAS, when, when the not-for-profit groups uh, or the Van Allen, you know, when, when people have a competition about building better housing or better communities, I think you get more diverse ideas coming together. And New York is a wonderful place to bring diverse ideas together and, and collaborations 
um, one, one of the things that we're looking at with the Sandy recovery is creating resilient communities that are built around um, managing climate change because, um, you know, like, like the Dutch were the one culture in Europe that weren't feudal. They were organized for centuries around keeping water out of their communities. And now New York needs to do that. So with BIG, we're looking at, you know, how do we define a community? How do we protect a community? How do we build the social infrastructure so that people can communicate around flood control, around disaster relief? How, how is that then, you know, how do the so social programs follow that? Um, how are new building types following that? And where are the public spaces, both indoors and outdoors, that create a sense of community? Mm. I would love to hear from you. What have you learned working in a place or working with people that you didn't expect to be learning from um, that you incorporate in your work that surprised you, that you realized, oh, if I hadn't crossed paths with this person, I would never have understood dit dot. Um, Gail, you were kind of talking about that. In Denver, there was a major uh, military base, the Denver and Stapleton, which was 5,000 acres. And the whole before, in, the whole community got involved in creating a set of design guidelines and a set a master plan and a master vision uh, and that tr totally transformed the, the thinking about the development and set the ground around which then the, the city did the selection process. And that's what they did in the Bronx. Uh, so I think it's, I guess, it's a very important issue, finding a way to be a partner and be proactive and getting input as opposed to just showing up and saying no. And I think okay. key to that is, which I don't know as a community member exactly how you do it, but it seems to me you want to get out there with the forces who might be have the capital to do something well in advance of formal processes because by the time the Euler, you know, by the time the rezoning comes along, the formal comment period is 30 okay. days. You know, what can be achieved, how much can really be achieved in that period? I mean, your comments can be registered, but it's much better, um, you know, if the comments, like you were saying, in the, you know, 30 years in the making are built into the plan in a more uh, organic way. Thank you. Um, th this, I know, is not what you're uh, looking for when, when you want specific examples about um, how to engage the community in, a pro in an early way, in a proactive way, and not just you know, final consent at the community board when it's kind of fait accompli. But um, I, I do think that um, academia can actually play a role in this. And um, I know, and having taught urban design at, at Yale for, for many years, we do look to do projects in um, uh, disempowered places, and the last year was Coney Island. Um, and when we do that, we really are talking to people on the street. They come and talk to us, we talk to them, we, we hope that there is a, a store owner who will display our work, whatever. But it also, it also is an indication that I think people can come to us. If, if, if we are in the business of wanting to um, do good before we put our <laughs> students out into the real world and you know whatever, and I and I think we are. Um, I, I communities um, can and do come to us and maybe can do it more. So I, so to think think of the academy as a place that can actually. But maybe that. we yeah. as architects and urban planners and landscape architects also have a responsibility to engage the public because it is difficult as an individual to yeah. engage and get a seat at the table. And I think that most of us actually take that responsibility very seriously, which is why we try very hard to get involved from very early on in the process. And this is what I was speaking to at the very beginning, that our job in what we do as city builders is not just to answer the question that we are hired to answer, but to raise those questions mm -hmm. that our client is not asking us right. about. We had uh, on Grid TV the great, up the great um, privilege of being in touch with a lot of people who had gone through Katrina, who we were able to then interview again after Sandy to suggest, you know, well, what advice do you have for the communities here in New York? What to, what to anticipate? And one of the very strong messages is you have a plan to address the rebuilding mm. or the not rebuilding. The community needs to come up with its set of principles of its visions. 
Mm -hmm. um, but that's also another part. Like, can we communicate regionally around shared experience? Mm -hmm. We the public as well as we the developers. Build that city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, everyone, for participating.